your gut microbiome kind of plays a huge role in a number of functions. But what can happen is the makeup of your gut microbiome can be damaged. And at some point you reach a threshold where doing uh, natural changes, changing your diet, sleeping better, exercising, um, could no longer bring back that dysfunction. And when you get to that point, you really need bacteria being put back into the gut to teach your gut what it should be doing. And so this is where uh, fecal microbiota transplantations or FMT come into play. We put this new bacteria in. Basically the idea here is it re-educates the gut. The information provided in this podcast is educational and not intended to diagnose or treat medical conditions. Are you struggling with bloating, gas, constipation, and fatigue, but don't know what's causing these problems? The Gut Health Reset Podcast with Dr. Anne-Marie Barter dives deep into the root causes behind these issues that start in the gut. This podcast will give you the knowledge you need to heal your gut and reset your health. Well, Shana, thank you so much for being here with us today. I'm really actually looking forward to this topic because there is... um, just a lot of questions around this one. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely um, a more interesting topic as like it's kind of mixes things people are uncomfortable with, with really exciting science. So mm-hmm. it's always a good, it's always a good conversation starter. So we're going to dig, I think, right into the meat of it, if that's okay. So um, why in the world would we want to do a fecal transplant? Yeah. So the idea here is that your gut microbiome kind of plays a huge role in a number of functions, ranging from like modulating your immune system to like processing the food you eat to communicating with your brain. So it's like really far reaching. But what can happen is the makeup of your gut microbiome can be damaged in a number of ways. Um, And at some point you reach a threshold where doing uh, natural changes, changing your diet, sleeping better, exercising, um, could no longer bring back that dysfunction. And so you get to a certain point where the gut is in something called gut dysbiosis. It just means that the gut isn't able to function um, at the at the rate that it should. And when you get to that point, you really need bacteria being put back into the gut to teach your gut what it should be doing. And so this is where uh, fecal microbiota transplantations or FMT come into play, where you take a a healthy donor's gut microbiome from their stool, which has like active bacteria in it. Um, And so these donors are are really highly screened. We're looking at everything from blood and stool screening, but as well as we look at their family history and their current and past medical history, they get an understanding of everything that could impact the gut microbiome. Um, this comes from like every couple of days to every couple of weeks, something new and exciting is coming out about what the gut can do. So what we do when we're screening is to ensure that anything that could possibly affect the gut is not in our donors. You purify their samples down. So it's just the bacteria, the good stuff, um, the gut microbiota that you want. And then someone who has gut diabetes is going to come and get that transplant. And we do, uh, at our company at Novel Biome, we do um, oral capsules, oral powders, and retentionas. Um, One of the more um, popular um, or the gold standard is colonoscopy as well. Colonoscopy is now kind of um, is what we compare every other method to. And we're finding oral capsules have the same outcomes. Um, So just it's a little bit easier than having to have a colonoscopy. We put this new bacteria in. Basically, the idea here is it re-educates the gut. Um, normally during gut dysbiosis, you have a really low diversity. So it's, it's not as many or the different types of bacteria you want there. Um, so before you get FMT, normally you're given like an antibiotic to kind of wipe out what is there. We put this new bacteria in that we know is a healthy and well-functioning gut microbiome. And then it teaches the gut what it should be doing and how to do, how to be its best self is kind of the idea behind it. Mm-hmm. And what disease states are you really seeing incredible changes with? Yeah. So right now, um, FMT is only approved for the use with C. diff, Mm -hmm. C. diff fill infections. And so outside of that, we're kind of seeing a lot of new research coming out. So personally at our company, we focus on autism spectrum disorder. There's been some groundbreaking work that's really shown that um, kids with ASD, 
have a lot of GI syndromes, they're actually three times more likely to have GI issues. And those GI issues tend to be more severe. So the use of FMT originally was kind of targeted at trying to alleviate these GI symptoms and kind of try to help the gastrointestinal system function better. Um, but what we see is a secondary effect we see at the company in this previous research, we're seeing that changes in autism related behaviors. And so um, it seems like it's a system. So when we change the gut, we're changing these, these kind of behaviors. Um, there's also work being done in um, inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel syndrome, but as well as diseases like Parkinson's and multiple sclerosis, as well as Alzheimer's disease. There's a lot of new clinical trials coming out trying to understand. We know that there's gut dysfunction in these diseases and some early preclinical or animal models, as well as some kind of case studies in humans, we're seeing changes in the gut lead to changes in these kind of um, outward behaviors or, or neuropsychiatric symptoms. So it's a really exciting field. We're learning kind of more every day, but the, the variety of diseases kind of grows as we learn more about it. Um, and some of these is where, you know, the first system is always GI and we're seeing secondary outcomes, but we have disorders like uh, in cancer, some of the treatments that you do are, are quite hard on the system. And so there's been some studies coming out that's showing people that are getting stem cell treatments what has to be done to prep the body to be able to get a stem cell treatment is quite invasive. And so they're finding if they put, do an FMT treatment um, during this process, it actually helps with reducing rejection of the stem cells, as well as uh, kind of increasing overall kind of comfort and health in these patients. So it's kind of wide reaching and it, it literally changes every couple of days, which is um, exciting, but keeps me very busy. <laughs> well, just out of curiosity, because you guys really specialize a lot in autism. I think that that's your, that that's your main specialty, correct? Yes. Yeah. So what are you guys seeing? And is there anything that is similar in the guts um, of children or of adults that have autism? What are you seeing with that? Yeah. So I think the first thing to understand is that the gut is really important in development. It seems to be tied to cognitive function. Um, we know the brain goes through these critical periods. So these certain things have to happen for brain development to kind of progress. We're actually seeing the same kind of trajectory as in the gut. Um, and when we're looking at um, children with ASD, their gut from the research seems to be um, underdeveloped. So it doesn't match where neurotypical peers are in kind of that developmental trajectory as well as their guts in general don't look the same. The makeup is different. And then we're also seeing these GI symptoms. On top of that, um, the severity of GI symptoms seems to be related to the severity of autism-related behaviors, um, as well as neurotransmitter cascades are different. Um, so serum, le serum levels of neurotransmitters are different, but as well as the process in which the gut makes neurotransmitters, those, those kind of pathways are also disrupted. So overall, it seems like the gut is, is really tied um, to the development of, of ASD. And so it's not to say that like gut dysfunction causes that, but it seems to be part of the process. Um, there's two major studies, and these are the studies that kind of spurred kind of the development of our company um, based on kind of parents outreaching, um, wondering could, could FMT you know, be a solution to kind of helping with GI symptoms, but as well as some of the other, the other issues related to, to having a child with ASD. So the first study came out, Dr. James Adams group in 2017 from Arizona State University did, um, did a study where they took children with ASD. Um, they did a gut prep, which included uh, an antibiotic, which is prepping the gut so that it can better take out in new bacteria. And then they did two days of high dose FMT and then eight weeks of a loading dose, which is just a small dose over a long period of time to ensure that basically the best engraftment or uptake of this new microbiome. And after that eight weeks of treatment, they looked eight weeks after that and they found that GI symptoms were 77% improved, um, but they also saw a 23% improvement in autism related behaviors and a shift in the gut microbiome to be more uh, towards typically developing pairs. They then, in 2019, did a two-year follow-up study, and this is kind of the one that still blows my mind. Um, they looked two years after, so they did eight weeks of FMT, and they looked two years after that, and they found that GI symptoms were still improved, but 
autism related behaviors continued to improve over time. So parents noted this as well as when looking at all of their measures, they found that instead of being 23% improved, they saw originally it was actually 47% improved from baseline. So these, these behaviors continue to improve with this new gut microbiome. They saw, also saw a shift in where um, these children would fall. So um, ASD is kind of sorted into being, you know, you have s- severe cases or they're, they're sorted as severe and then you have mild and moderate and, and under the kind of under the cutoff. And so originally most of these children would have been sorted as severe. And after two years, most of them actually fell from being not even being categorized on, on these standardized measures of, of, of having ASD. So these, these are huge changes and that's kind of what spurred us to kind of really focus in on, on children with autism and providing FMT um, because it's, it's, it's kind of magic what's happening um, and just changing the GI symptoms improves quality of life. But all these secondary outcomes we're seeing in autism related behaviors are really important and they, they really do make a huge difference. So how long has your longest follow-up study been? Is it the two year follow-up study? Yeah, the two years are the longest right now. That one came out in 2019. Um, there are some new studies coming out that have longer time windows, but they weren't, um, there's no initial study. So what they're looking at is like, well, what does it look like now? They're not kind of comparing back to their original baseline. Um, at our company, we are doing our own internal kind of keeping track of all these documents. And so that's something that our goal is to kind of have these these follow-ups long-term so that we can help kind of add to this data pool. Um, but it's we most people haven't been doing it for long enough to have longer follow-ups than kind of this, this two-year follow-up at this point. You, you also said uh, that in autistic uh, children or ASD on the spectrum in some in some some way, um, that their neurotransmitter pathways were destroyed in the gut. Do you know specifically which ones were destroyed or altered, or were there? They... Yeah. So they're um, they're they're biosynthesis pathways. Um, so this is basically like how the molecules are transformed into becoming a neurotransmitter. It seems like there's some dysfunction there. Um, there's no definitive, like these ones are the ones that are changed and these ones aren't. Um, there has been studies that have shown dopamine seems to be altered, neuroepinephrine. Um, but we're just now, I think, fully understanding how much the gut produces neurotransmitters. And so I think we're starting to really start to kind of dig into that more. Um, some of the, our understanding that the gut could even make neurotransmitters has only been around for about 10, 15 years. Um, and that's just like the general concept of that it could even happen. Um, we're still now starting to get that, like, it's a lot more than we originally appreciated. Um, a recent study a couple of years came out looking at serotonin, which we know plays a huge role in mood and, and neurological communications and things like that. 90% of the serotonin in our body is made in our gut. So Um, something that we know is a building block to kind of bring communication and is really important. Most of it's coming from our gut. So now I think we're kind of backing up and trying to understand, okay, so like what is being created? What bacteria plays the biggest role in that? Um, And some of the big ones, of course, serotonin, neuroepinephrine and dopamine, glutamate, GABA, all of them seem to be highly produced in the gut. Um, But we're just getting at that these pathways really exist. So I think I think in the next couple of years, we'll have a better understanding, but we're at the point now we're still learning what bacteria are there and um, what it looks like when one bacteria is missing. And you're looking at, there's like a hundred trillion different bacteria in the gut. Um, So it's a huge, like even just, we're just getting to the ability to even look at it because the methods to look at this are only now being created. Um, So that's why things are changing so quickly because how we used to look at these, you couldn't look at all of it. Um, So now you have things like kind of machine learning and stuff coming into play of being able to take these huge data sets and make them make sense. So it's a, it's a field that will continue to grow quickly, I think, but it's all kind of, we're all on the cusp of just getting it. That's great. So I, you know, I have talked um, on the podcast about C. diff and um, how they are doing fecal transplants for that. And my understanding coming away from that podcast was it's harder to become a fecal donor than it is to get into Harvard Law. So 
Um, can you talk about safety and um, how you guys are screening your donors and yeah, that process? So donor screening is the most important thing, I think, when it comes to FMT, because you're relying on what the donor's gut microbiome looks like. Um, there were some really early initial studies looking in, in animal models, but like the having obesity transferring the gut microbiome can transfer those obese tendencies over. So we know it's really important to know what you're getting. Um, so the way that donor screening is broken down, the first thing you do is initial screening. That's your health screening, your family health history, um, just to get an understanding of, is there anything in your gut that could possibly be transferred. We don't know if it could be, but we do everything. So um, there's some published standards. And in those cases, about 50 to 90% of people don't make it past the initial screening. Um, we actually have higher standards than what's 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 normally kind of put into place. So um, outside of just looking at different disorders and things that could be transferred, we also, um, none of our donors could have ever had antibiotics in their entire life. Um, we know antibiotics can have a huge impact on the gut microbiome. Normally you're looking at three to six months of not having antibiotics. We've chosen to go with never having it. Um, all of our donors are vaginally born because we know that that's kind of the beginning or the building blocks of the gut microbiome. And there's a huge shift, um, in different modes of delivery, um, as well as all of our donors are physically active. And we, and, uh, every time they donate, we look at what they've eaten in the last couple of days to ensure that it's kind of a widely diverse diet. Cause we know that diet can impact the gut microbiome in 24 hours. So we're making sure that on that day that we know that their, their gut microbiome is the best that it could be going through our initial screening. I get through like four questions and I'm out. Um, and I'm like generally a healthy human being. And so it really gives you an appreciation of if, how stringent it is to be able to be a donor. If you get past the initial screening, then you have blood and stool screening done. And you're looking at it. We look at about 120 different factors within blood and stool um, to you have to pass all of those. And the, you get retested blood and stool screening every three months. Um, and so what we're doing here is basically everything that we can control and get an understanding of in something that is so diverse. Um, we try to put as many kind of controls in there to ensure that you know, nothing is going to be transferred to a patient um, that could then, you know, hinder their ability to get better or really get a full kind of all the benefits out of getting FMT. Outside of that and safety, we do a lot of work with product manufacturing, um, which sounds a lot less cool, but it's really important because what you're doing here is consistency and how you make a product is really important because you want to be able to, it's the same with food. You want to be able to know that every time you go and get that packaged food, you like it tastes the same and it cooks the same. That's kind of what we're doing with FMT. So we're using pharmaceutical grade um, standards in a pharmaceutical grade laboratory to create these capsules and, and these enemas. And that's a really important thing. And that's where the field is headed is kind of making sure that everything is done just like you would create any other type of drug that someone's going to take to ensure that all of the safeguards are in place to, to make sure that no one's going to get sicker or everybody's going to get what they, you know, they're, what they know they're doing when they're doing FMT. Got it. Okay. And then so let's say there's somebody out, out there that's like, oh, this would be perfect for my child. So what does that process look like for someone who is interested in this? Yeah. So we have four treatment locations. So we partner with, um, we partner with facilities that have the medical staff and the capabilities, and then we provide product and a treatment protocol for them. So we have a group in Hungary and Panama in Mexico and Australia. So those are the four countries that we provide treatment out of. Um, and anyone that's interested, the way that our program works is you can go to our website. It gives you all the information you could possibly ever want to know about FMT, right from you know the history behind it up to how we, we currently do FMT. And then you can book a phone call to talk with someone on our team. You can't actually book a treatment on our website. Um, we want to ensure that there's a conversation had that people fully understand what they're, they're kind of looking into and make sure that all their questions are answered to try to perform, provide the most kind of transparent and, uh, informed pr process for every parent or every 
person that wants to try to look into FMT. So they can just go to our website, book a call, and then they can have a conversation about it, ask all the questions they have, and so that they can get a full understanding of what we do and why we're doing it and if it would be a fit. Um, it won't be a fit for everybody. Um, we want to make sure that everyone's understanding of what can happen, everybody's understanding of what the outcomes look like and where we're at scientifically is everybody has that understanding. Got it. And what is, can you also just to wrap up here, can you tell uh, where people can get in contact? What was the name of that website? Yeah, it's a uh, novel biome. So N O V E L B I O M E.com. Um, and the only caveat is we don't treat Canadians. Um, so Canadians can't access our website and they can't book any treatments. Um, that's in conjunction with the governing health body in Canada. Um, but outside of that, everyone can can go and take a look and, and kind of get an understanding of, you know, what it is. And we try to be as educational as possible. We have um, a YouTube channel, which we just like basically is like explaining all of the questions that people tend to ask um, and just trying to supply information because this is a really important, I think, new treatment option. But it's one that I think comes with a lot of um, questions and, and people wanting to understand why it could work. And it works It works kind of in a mysterious way. We don't understand fully right now what the mechan mechanism of action or how it works is. So we're trying to give people as much information as we can. That's great. Well, thank you so much for being here and sharing your knowledge and, um, and sharing kind of the, the breakthroughs of this new treatment. Thank you. 